If you were asked to compile a list of the greatest and most influential superheroes of all time, you'd have no shortage of iconic characters to choose from. From the Golden Age trailblazers like Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman and Captain America, to the stars of Marvel's 1960s renaissance, Spider-Man, the X-Men and the Avengers. Truly, the comic book landscape is full of beloved characters that have changed the medium significantly over the past century. However, a name that undoubtedly deserves to be placed on that list, high up as one of the most important and influential comic book characters of all time, Miracle Man, or as he was originally known, Marvel Man. Originally created in 1954 by Mick Anglo, Miracle Man is a character that would set a new precedent for the future of the entire comic book industry, with in particular his 1980s reinvention by Alan Moore, progressing the medium of superhero comics in bold new directions. Moore's Miracle Man series, which ran from 1982 to 1988, is a book that pioneered many modern approaches to comic book storytelling, with its postmodern, deconstructive and dystopian reimagining of a classic golden age hero, leaving an imprint on the superhero landscape that is still very much felt today. And so, in this video, I want to break down the history behind this fascinating character, the unusual story behind his creation, and how he was revived by Alan Moore for an entirely new generation decades later, and how the writer used this unique character to forever change the landscape of comic books and superheroes. Before we continue though, just a quick reminder to leave a like on this video if you enjoy it, and subscribe to Owen Likes Comics so you don't miss out on any future videos. In order to understand how the character of Miracle Man came to be, it's first important to briefly overview the golden age of comics, and the explosion of popularity in superheroes in the late 1930s and 40s. You see, with the monumental success of Action Comics issue 1 and the first appearance of Superman, superhero comic books exploded into pop culture throughout the tail end of the 1930s, with almost every major publisher at the time gunning to create their own costume crime fighter. Captain Marvel in particular is crucial to understanding the story of Miracle Man, as following his first appearance in Wiz Comics issue 2 from February 1940, he became a major rival to Superman in terms of being the best-selling comic book character. Not only did Billy Batson's debut issue sell over half a million copies, but the character frequently outsold Superman for a notable period of time. This unprecedented rise would soon begin to fall though, as in 1948, Fawcett Comics, the company who produced Captain Marvel, were taken to court by national ally public publications, the company that would later become DC Comics, claiming that their hero was heavily based on the last son of Krypton. Now, this legal battle lasted for many years, eventually causing Fawcett to cease publication of all Captain Marvel comics in 1953. This decision had major ramifications on the international comic book markets, as Captain Marvel had become a hugely successful character overseas, particularly in Great Britain. Ever since 1943, Leonard Miller and his company L. Miller & Son had been publishing reprints of many of Fawcett's comics for UK readers, with Captain Marvel Adventures being their best-selling title. With the news of the character's impending hiatus, Miller saw a way to continue publishing Captain Marvel in some form, enlisting Mick Anglo, a prominent British comic book writer and packager, to help transform Billy Batson into a brand new character. This led to the creation of Marvel Man, who made his first appearance in February 1954. At first glance, Marvel Man was almost identical to Captain Marvel. The comic centred around a young reporter called Mickey Moran, who, when saying the magic word Kimota, transforms into an adult superhero. The similarities between these two characters was no coincidence, with Mick Anglo recalling that, In the last of the Marvel titles, we announced that Captain Marvel and Captain Marvel Jr. were so well known as Marvel Men, that in the future they would be known by the titles Marvel Man and Young Marvel Man, and each would have their own comic. The Marvel Family title, featuring the heroes in action together, would henceforth appear as the Marvel Man family in a new monthly comic. There was no hitch, no hiatus. The new titles were greeted with increased sales and letters poured in from enthusiastic kids. Marvel Man would make his debut in issue 25 of his now self-titled series, with a new monthly title, The Marvel Man Family, debuting in October 1956. And although these comics proved to be successful for L. Miller and Sons, throughout much of the 1950s, problems began to arise at the very end of the decade. You see, in 1959, the British government lifted its restrictions on non-essential imports between Britain and the United States, meaning that American-based comic book companies could begin distributing their books in the UK 
for the first time, having previously required a local company to reproduce them for British audiences. Because of this, many popular comics from both DC and Marvel began to make their way across the Atlantic, severely hampered the popularity of books such as Marvel Man, eventually leading to the cancellation of the Marvel Man family in November 1959 before the character's two remaining titles, Marvel Man and Young Marvel Man, were both cancelled in February 1963. Only a few years after this, L. Miller and Son filed for bankruptcy, and by 1966, virtually any trace of this once beloved hero had largely disappeared from pop culture. Throughout his nine-year publication run, Marvel Man had appeared in over 700 comic books, in addition to various annuals, specials, and colouring books. He was, at one point, the most popular superhero in Great Britain, as well as the nation's longest-running superhero comic book ever, and now seemed to be relegated to the annals of history, destined to be forgotten. And while it would take some time for Marvel Man to finally make his return, much like the hero's fabled origin, it would only take a spark to reignite his legacy. By the early 1980s, the character of Marvel Man had largely disappeared. By this time, the internationally beloved superheroes of Marvel and DC Comics dominated newsstands across the United Kingdom. Mick Anglo had retired from comics, and Leonard Miller had sadly passed away. What was once a cultural phenomenon now showed very few traces of even happening, existing in the minds of only a handful of young comic fans who grew up reading Marvel Man's heroic adventures. Thankfully, one of these young fans who grew up with Marvel Man was Alan Moore, a writer who had begun to make his name in the comic book industry in Britain at this time. As Moore made his name working on the likes of the Doctor Who Weekly comic, as well as stories for both 2000 AD and Marvel UK, he had expressed a desire to revive the Marvel Man character in some form. As Moore would explain in an interview with Mania.com, The origin of the reinvented character, as far as I was concerned, was, as a small boy I'd been visiting Yarmouth with my parents, which is a British seaside resort that we used to go to every year. And I remember that the little seaside bookstores used to sell comics and books that would presumably have been on a different distribution circuit. And sort of, you'd get titles turning up that you wouldn't get at your newsagents and bookstores at home. I had picked up a copy of a young Marvel Man annual, which was a strange hard-covered thing that would be completely unfamiliar to an American audience. But this was a collection of young Marvel Man and Marvel Man strips by Mick Angler. I also picked up a copy of one of the Ballantine paperbacks of Harvey Kurtzman's Brilliant Mad. It was one that had Super Duper Man. Since I picked up those two things on the same day, and bearing in mind that I was 12, it occurred to me that maybe I could do a brilliant parody like Super Duper Man, but of an English superhero. So I started to imagine a kind of parody of Marvel Man, where he had forgotten his magic word. I don't know where I was going to do this obviously derivative piece of work, and it never happened, but the idea did kind of lodge in my mind. Moore's rise throughout the industry coincided with a period of rejuvenation for comic books in Britain, as the medium's readership had begun to expand from just children to young adults and university students. And with the rising popularity of more mature and adult-orientated comics such as 2000 AD, Des Skin, the former editorial director for Marvel UK, sought to launch his own anthology comic series, Warrior. And within it, he intended to reprint the original Mick Anglo Marvel Man comic strips, alongside a series of brand new stories for featuring the character. As Skin would later explain in an interview with Back Issue magazine, It was always going to be Marvel Man. I knew the character's history, I'd had a few of those annuals as a kid and those cheap, nasty little comics. Wasn't particularly thrilled with them, outside of the occasional stunning art, but I'd always had a soft spot for Michelangelo. So given the difference between a brand new character who would sell no more copies, or a somewhat forgotten character who might sell a dozen more, I opted to follow the similar relaunch I'd done with Captain Britain, tease at first, then as a bonus, surprise those who actually cared. If it failed, it was only six pages out of 52. The beauty of the anthology approach. Skin began approaching various comic writers about producing the new issues of Marvel Man, with both Steve Parkhouse and Steve Moore passing on the opportunity, with the latter recommending Alan Moore for the job instead. After meeting with Skin, Moore was quickly tasked with writing a series of new comic strips, teaming up with artist Gary Leach to bring this character back to life. The pair's efforts would eventually make it to print in March of 1982, when issue one of the all-new Warrior comic hit shelves and Mickey Moran would heroically transform into Marvel Man once again.
Marvel Man's triumphant return would begin with an eight-page story entitled A Dream of Flying. This story would very much set the template for what would become Alan Moore's radical reinvention of the classic hero, reintroducing Mickey Moran now as a disillusioned adult, with no memory of his time as Marvel Man. Instead, Michael is plagued with dreams of his former life, though uncertain of what they actually mean. The story would see him attempt to report on a protest when he's suddenly taken hostage by a band of terrorists, causing him to, in panic, utter the word Kimota and suddenly transform back into his superpowered alter ego. As Michael easily overpowers the terrorists, he flies into the sky and out of orbit, staring at the world as he says four simple words that would change the comic book industry forever. I'm Marvel Man, I'm back. Following his epic transformation, Marvel Man returns home, startling his wife Liz and revealing both his true identity and his past to her. Michael explains that back in 1954, when he worked as a copyboy for a local newspaper, he received his extraordinary abilities, fighting crime alongside his two best friends and sidekicks. While Liz doesn't initially believe him, Mike recalls how his heroic seemed fun and without consequences at the time. However, after being hit with an atomic bomb when attempting to stop the villainous Dr. Gargunza, the severity of his actions began to sink in, waking up months later in a hospital with several injuries and no memory of his alter ego. The pair embrace, as we see Jonathan Bates, the former Kid Marvel man, hear news of his former partner's resurgence. Jonathan soon contacts Mike and invites him and Liz to visit, as we learn that not only did young Marvel man die in the explosion, but Jonathan managed to survive and was able to rebuild his life. As the two heroes reminisce atop a skyscraper, Mike begins to question Jonathan's story, causing Bates to suddenly attack both Mike and Liz, demonstrating that he still has his powers, and never reverted back to his child form after the blast. Transforming into Marvel Man, Mike takes the fight to his former partner. Despite Mike's power though, he is seemingly no match for his younger sidekick. As Jonathan stands over him victorious, he declares that Kid Marvel Man has usurped his mentor. However, uttering the hero's name causes him to be turned back into his human form, as Jonathan transforms into the scared, introverted child that a young Mike Moran befriended as a kid with Marvel Man choosing to spare his life and allow the authorities to apprehend him. From here, we begin to learn more about the people responsible for Marvel Man's origin, as the secret government organisation Spook Show learns of the hero's return and tasks Evelyn Cream with exterminating him. Cream ambushes Marvel Man whilst in human form, taking him to Spook Show's headquarters, where Mike learns that all of his memories and the dreams he was having for many years are all lies. Instead, Mike learns that he and his fellow sidekicks were the result of an experiment called Project Zarathustra that attempted to enhance the human body using alien technology, with Marvel Man, Kid Marvel Man and Young Marvel Man all being kept within a simulation, heavily based on the adventures of fictional comic book characters. However, some time after Project Zarathustra began, the British government attempted to shut it down. It's then revealed that their final adventure was the only real one that they ever did, with the atomic bomb that hit Marvel Man and his friends being intended to kill all the remaining subjects. Following this revelation, Marvel Man also learns that he and Michael Moran are two distinct beings that happen to exist within a shared space, and that when one transforms into the other, the other lives in what's known as info space. This distinction between Mike and Marvel Man is amplified when we learn that Liz is pregnant, with the comic forcing us to speculate which of the two personas is the biological father. Soon after, Liz is kidnapped by Dr. Gargunza, Marvel Man's creator and the former chief scientist of Project Zarathustra, who seeks to transform for his consciousness into that of Liz's unborn child. As Marvel Man searches across the world for Gargunza, this series would come to an abrupt cliffhanger, as the final pages of Warrior issue 21 would see a bolt of lightning come down from the sky, as Evelyn Cream emerges from the shadows, informing Liz that her husband is on the way to save her. Marvel Man triumphantly arrives, only to be suddenly depowered by Gargunza, who, with the hero helpless, transforms his pet Pluto into the monstrous Marvel Dog, with the fate of Michael Moran, Liz and Evelyn Cream all being left unclear. Following the release of Warrior Issue 21, the Marvel Man stories would go on hiatus, due to ongoing financial disputes between Alan Moore and Des Skin. As these disputes waged on, Warrior also became engrossed with a dispute with Marvel Comics, who were intending to take Skin and his company, Quality Communications, to court over the rights to Marvel Man's name. Because of these problems, Skin decided to abandon the Marvel Man character, attempting to license it to several different American publishers. At one point, he even pitched the character to 
to Marvel's then editor-in-chief Jim Shooter, with Skin recalling that, Shooter said, we can't do Marvel Man. And I said, but you are Marvel. He said, yeah, but the trouble is, if his name is Marvel Man, he represents the entire company. It would be like if this character was called DC Man. He'd represent DC. We couldn't have a figurehead character who's involved in a bizarre sexual triangle with a wife who'd rather sleep with the Greek god superhero than the 40-year-old pudgy secret identity, and all this other stuff. Besides, he's British. How could he possibly represent us? After being rejected by both Marvel and DC Comics, and Pacific Comics going out of business, Skin eventually made a deal with Eclipse Comics in September 1984, with the company reprinting Moore's 18-chapter saga as a new six-issue comic series, as well as changing the character's name from Marvel Man to Miracle Man. Once the existing strips had been re-released, Eclipse contacted Moore to continue on with his original story. As such, Miracle Man issue 7 would pick up where the original cliffhanger left off, with Mike and Liz on the run for Miracle Dog as Cream is killed by the monstrous creature. Eventually, Mike is able to depower the dog, Mike then returns to the villain's base, transforms into Miracle Man, and confronts Dr. Gargunza, flying him out of orbit before dropping him back down to the Earth. With his villainous creator now dead, Miracle Man rescues Liz just as she begins to go into labour, causing the hero to deliver the baby in a remote field. Later, as Mike and Liz adjust to parenthood, naming their newborn daughter Winter, we see Jonathan Bates in hospital, being taunted by his psychotic alter ego. As he battles with his fractured mind, Jonathan is suddenly visited by a mysterious couple, later revealed to be members of the alien race, the Quiche. Mike is confronted by the mysterious aliens. These aliens reveal that five creations were derived from the original crash that landed on Earth, these being Miracle Man, Young Miracle Man, and Kid Miracle Man, as well as Miracle Dog and the previously unseen Miracle Woman, leading to a fight between them. As this happens, Mike and Liz's home is attacked by another alien, this one searching for winter, before Miracle Woman makes her dramatic first appearance and saves both Liz and her daughter. Miracle Woman meets with Miracle Man soon after, as the pair are transported to a faraway galaxy by the Quiche, who explain that they were created using the remains of one of their spaceships, and the aliens are intending to kill them to cover up their mistakes, before discovering Winter's birth. They explain that due to her existence as a naturally born superhuman, Earth now deserves to be spared, and alongside their intergalactic rivals, the Warpsmiths, appoint both Miracle Man and Miracle Woman as watchers over the planet's superhuman population. As Miracle Man returns home, excitedly recounting his interstellar adventure to Liz, she suddenly breaks down in tears before explaining that the strain of raising a superpowered child is too much for her to bear, and leaves. From here, the final three issues of Miracle Man would build to its epic conclusion. As Winter begins to speak and further develop her powers each day, the father-daughter duo fly throughout the night sky. Initially, it seems that Miracle Man is comforted, knowing that some part of his family remains with him, only for Winter to soon reveal her intentions to travel deep into the galaxy, seeking further education on her powers from the quiche. After the pair say an emotional goodbye, Miracle Man transforms into Mike Moran for one final time, leaving behind a suicide note as he lets his alter ego take his place for good. Meanwhile, we see Jonathan Bates now in a children's home, being abused by the older children, causing him to give in and allow Kid Miracle Man to take over once again, beginning a violent path of destruction, killing everyone in his way before making it out into the London streets. Issue 15, released in November 1988, is perhaps the most famous of Moore's entire run, as Kid Miracle Man rampages throughout London, as the villain is eventually confronted by Miracle Man, and the pair battle throughout the destroyed wreckage that once resembled London. London. With the help of the other remaining superhumans, including Miracle Woman and the Warpsmiths, Miracle Man is eventually able to turn Johnny back into his childlike form. As the two former partners sit and miss the devastation, Johnny suddenly realises what he has done, begging Miracle Man for help. Miracle Man puts his arm around his childhood friend, before swiftly and mercifully killing him, putting an end to both his rampage and the decades of suffering he had endured at the hands of his alter ego. The final issue in this story would serve as the epilogue 
Mark for Moore's entire Miracle Man story. As the closing pages of issue 15 see a London in ruins, the following issue opens with a sprawling futuristic utopia. Set several years after his fight with Kid Miracle Man, we learn that Miracle Man and his allies use the destruction of London as a pretext for taking over the world's government, essentially becoming Greek gods and rebuilding the world in their own image. We see that while the heroes have rebuilt the world, eradicating war, famine and poverty, those without superpowers now exist without free will, becoming second class citizens to the godlike beings that live above them. The comic ends on a rather bittersweet note, as Miracle Man looks down upon the earth from his extravagant fortress known as Olympus, pondering whether his actions truly were for the greater good, whether he in fact saved humanity or enslaved it much in the same way the villains he used to fight sought to. He wonders to himself, whether this new world really is perfect, and whether his dreams of flying were finally realised, or whether, instead, they have become a nightmare. In so many ways, Alan Moore's Miracle Man is a truly era and genre defining comic. In just 16 issues, the writer had not only revived a forgotten Silver Age hero, but broke new ground in the types of stories that superhero comics could tell, beginning a trend that would send shockwaves throughout the entire industry for decades to come. While Moore departed the title following the release of issue 16, Miracle Man would actually continue on until 1994, with Neil Gaiman taking over as the new writer. However, Gaiman's Run would be ultimately cut short as Eclipse Comics went bankrupt before the release of issue 25, and after the company's assets were purchased by Todd McFarlane, a decades long legal battle between the two occurred over the rights to the Miracle Man character. It's only actually in the past decade that Miracle Man has somewhat returned to the spotlight, with original creator Mick Anglo regaining full control of his rights and selling them to Marvel in 2014. Nevertheless, though, Alan Moore's run on this series absolutely fascinates me, as it's not only a seminal piece of British comic book history, but a true cornerstone moment of the tonal and stylistic changes the medium would go through throughout the mid to late 1980s. The success of books like Miracle Man and V for Vendetta would launch Alan Moore into superstardom, resulting in the creation of several high-profile stories such as Watchmen, The Killing Joke, and Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow. And although those books are often regarded as being among Moore's best, I think Miracle Man is arguably the writer's most quintessential story. To me, Miracle Man is very much a precursor to the approach and storytelling techniques he would adopt when writing Watchmen, very much deconstructing the archetype of classic Silver Age superheroes and reimagining them in a complex dystopian world on the brink of collapse. Much like Watchmen, Miracle Man is a cautionary tale of how power corrupts, as Michael Moran evolves from being an ordinary everyman protagonist to a godlike dictator controlling the entire world. Honestly, this is a comic book that I have so much love for, and I truly believe is one of the most important to ever be put to page. And when you factor in the character's humble origins as a Captain Marvel knockoff, to his unexpected revival and renaissance as a foundational piece of modern superhero deconstruction, Miracle Man is a character who has, against all odds, managed to endure, and has garnered a legacy greater than anyone could have honestly imagined. Without this 16 issue saga, the landscape of superhero comics could be so different today, and it's this unquestionable impact that makes Alan Moore's Miracle Man nothing short of an underrated comic book masterpiece. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching today's video, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to leave a like on the video and leave a comment down below as well. Let me know your thoughts on everything we talked about in today's video, I can't wait to hear what you have to say as always. If you're new to Owen Likes Comics, please make sure to hit the subscribe button and the notify bell so you don't miss out on any future videos. And if you enjoyed this video and you want some more, there should be some others on screen right now that you might also enjoy. If you want to help support the channel and help me make more videos, you can do so over at patreon.com slash owenlikescomics. Or if you just want some more of me, you can follow me on Twitter just at owenlikescomics. But that's all for this video though. Again, thank you all so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed it and hopefully I'll see you next time. But until then, take care and keep reading.